Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. I see we have a good number of attendees, and we're really excited to share this really nice presentation about the synchronous tracking of oxygen saturation in vital organs, the effects beyond heart failure being presented by Pierre Sicard. My name is Christina Asa. I'm an application scientist with Fujifilm Visual Sonics out of our Toronto office. Just a couple notes about today's webinar before we get started. We are recording our session for today and we will make that recording available in just a couple days. All of the lines are muted for the duration of the webinar, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom panel at any point throughout the presentation to ask any questions you might have. We will answer questions at the end of our session. We do expect the presentation to be about 30 minutes, leaving us five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Pierre Sicard is a research engineer at INSERM in Montpellier, France, where he leads the ultrasound photoacoustic platform. Dr. Sicard obtained a PhD in cardiovascular physiology in 2007 from the University of Burgundy. He studied the interplay between oxidative stress, hypertension, and their consequences on the heart. In 2007, he joined the cardiovascular division at St. Thomas's Hospital, King's College, London, UK, as a postdoctoral fellow to investigate the importance of P38 MAPK isoforms during experimental myocardial infarction. He continued his research at the Institute of Metabolic and Cardiovascular Diseases in Toulouse, France, in order to develop a bench to bedside project about the potential contribution of GADD45 proteins in post myocardial infarction remodeling. His current research interests focus on the mechanisms involved in multi organ dysfunction after right or left ventricular myocardial infarction. Without any further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Dr. Sicard. Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction, Christina. Um, so I would like to say, first of all, hello to everyone. Um, very glad to be here. And thank you very much for Visual Sonics to give me the opportunity to present our work we are, we are doing uh, in, uh, in the lab in Montpellier in France. Basically, uh, I will talk a, a little, uh, about uh, myocardial infarction and how myocardial infarction affects uh, affect, uh, vital organs and the detection of uh, oxygen saturation. So first of all, I would like to go a little bit through our outline. Uh, I will go very quickly about uh, backgrounds, uh, how myocardial infarction affects vital organs. And then um, try to describe our experimental uh, data design, uh, mainly how we use high resolution presence and photoacoustic imaging, and how we uh, correlate uh, this data to histological markers and the plasmatic biomarkers. And then next, uh, I will divide the results in two parts. Uh, one will be about left ventricular ischemia and the relation with uh, oxygen saturation. And the other part, I will focus a little bit more about the right ventricle, especially after myocardial infarction and how we can assess oxygen saturation in this case. Uh, and a small conclusion uh, at the end. So to begin, um, you probably all known, uh, all known that, that myocardial infarction is mostly due to coronary artery thrombosis. And if you don't have reperfusion as soon as possible, you may lose quite a lot of cardiomyocytes and uh, you, it will be replaced by fibrosis, fibroblasts, uh, by leukocytes, creates inflammation and fibrosis. So a lot of remodeling process. But at the end, you will lose some cardiac function. And if you lose some lot cardiac function after my a big infarct, you will expect to see a decrease in cardiac outputs, increase in inflammation status, oxidative stress, uh, expect to see hypertension, systemic vasoconstriction, and at the end, end organ hypoperfusion. And uh, hypoperfusion in some uh, 
major um, some major organ like lungs, kidney, liver, or even brain. And when you lose some uh, this organ failure or dysfunction, it's called cardiogenic shock after MI. And cardiogenic shock complicates nearly five to ten percent of cases of uh, acute myocardial infarction and is a leading cause of death after MI. Uh, and the severity of non-cardiac organ injury and the number of organs affected exist on a spectrum from transient mild dysfunction to severe and irreversible multi-organ damage. So there are a couple of papers, and this one was an interesting paper that conclude that the presence of multi-organ failure here in the red square uh, after MI was independently associated with higher mortality compared to non-organ failure after MI. So in a sense, it's really important to detect organ dysfunction in order to stratify the patient and give them optimal therapies as soon as possible. You can do that by assessing circulating biomarkers. Um, they are frequently used in critically ill patients um, like lactate, azad, creatinemia, whatever you want. But they are sensitive, but not really specific to tissular hypoxia. You can assess detection direct detection of microcirculation. It's another way, uh, but using, for example, intravital imaging. However, the image resolution make it very difficult to analyze, but I think the major problem is to assess directly uh, microcirculation in kidney, liver, and uh, maybe more problematic for the brain. Um, so, so it's very difficult to use it in routine. So we think that real-time monitoring of specific organ oxygenation level may be an interesting possibility. And so in our work, uh, we hypothesize that photoacoustic imaging could detect early and specific end organ hypoperfusion, in specifically in liver, liver, kidney, and brain, following experimental myocardial infarction. So to do that, we use our established model of myocardial infarction in mice uh, by tying permanently the left anterior descending artery, coronary artery. After that, we observed cyanosis, ST elevation, and uh, we wait at three different time points. We measure cardiac function at four hours after MI, one day and seven day post MI. We use high resolution presence and it's a quick, um, quick slides to, to present our setup. We are, we are using in the lab. We use a Vivo LaserX. Um, we have some table, uh, table with, uh, we, we can control the temperature, the body temperature. We monitor the body temperature. We monitor as well the heart rate and respiratory rate with the ECG e-box, which gives you some precise information how the mice is uh, going during the procedure. And we use the uh, MX550 uh, at four, uh, 40 megahertz. And uh, by hand, uh, we use, so we can move everywhere in every direction to get nice images uh, on the long axis uh, of the left ventricle, short axis view, et cetera, et cetera. We use isofluran at nearly 3% induction. And during the procedure, it's nearly 1.5 to 2 uh, in steady states. So uh, specifically for this uh, presentation, I will present some data about the 2D strain analysis that gives you the possibility to uh, using the Vivo strain software to uh, differentiate uh, uh, every segment of the left ventricle, which is moving or which is not. Then we move to photoacoustic imaging to uh, detect oxygen saturation in multiple organs. So 
For, for the people who are not very familiar about photoacoustic, I will present in a couple of slides uh, what is this effect. I will try to explain to you. Uh, so basically, it's quite a, an old phenomenon discovered by Graham Bell, uh, Graham Bell uh, quite a century ago. Uh, basically, the effect is he discovers that the light can create some sounds. And so right now, the technology changes, of course, and uh, thanks to uh, Visual Sonics, we, we, we have this technology in our lab, and uh, it gives you the possibility to create some sounds with some nano, nano pulse laser and to combine optical imaging and ultrasound imaging. So to make this long story short, you have nanoseconds per laser that illuminates uh, the tissue in mice here. The light is absorbed by chromophores and causing thermoelastic expansion. And this thermoelastic expansion creates ultrasound wave. And this ultrasound wave is directly detected by the ultrasound probe and give you, after some pro signal processing, give you two different images. One from ultrasounds to get anatomical um, data, and one from opticals to get you some um, molecular data. But uh, you will ask what, what, uh, we will, uh, what we'll use uh, with photoacoustic. We can detect endogenous contrast. If you set up the laser at different wavelengths, here you have the wavelengths in the abscess and here the absorption coefficient. If you set up the laser at 750 and another uh, and at 850, you will be able to discriminate between total hemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. So you will have access to the, in real time, the oxygen saturation in some organs. So this is the setup here from, uh, from, from, from the lab. Uh, you can see we use the MX250 here with the two laser fiber uh, on the, in each side of the probe. We put the mice to uh, detect art or abdominal uh, photoacoustic images on the back. And uh, we record ECG using the e-box. You can uh, put uh, 3D motors to have a 3D uh, view of the, of the photoacoustic image. For the brain, Pierre, we return the animals and uh, we use a stereotactic frames that give you this possibility to have very nice images without any respiratory movement of the, um, of the mice. And what is important that we use, uh, we, we can get some images in intact skin and intact skull. Uh, so, and we use under isofluran uh, as the same as uh, high resolution ultrasound. So using this possibility, we have this um, multiple organ uh, oxygenation uh, saturation in heart, brain, kidney, and liver in, uh, in nearly takes 10 minutes, um, nearly 15 minutes to get uh, all of that in one mice. So it's quite, quite fast. Then we try to uh, use some biomarker, plasmatic biomarkers at uh, three different time points, four hours, day one, day seven. Uh, we assess creatinemia as a talat for liver, creatinemia for kidney function. And uh, we had a look about uh, histology. We try to find out if there is any uh, microvascularization defects uh, using histology. And we use uh, pericytes to, to, to label pericytes. Uh, I will uh, explain you uh, a little bit later uh, this uh, results. So first of all, uh, the left ventricular dysfunction was assessed by uh, strain analysis. As you can see, uh, you have the 2D strain analysis in long axis view, the sham 
is working well. Uh, and when you move to LA delegation on the right here, uh, you see some uh, akinetic segments nearly in the mid apex uh, of the left, uh, left ventricle. You can put a number on it and we assess longitudinal strain. And after MI, you expect to see a decrease in the longitudinal strain um, in the myocardial infarction mice. It goes down to 5% on longitudinal strain compared to 17% uh, for, the, for the sham. Now we move to uh, try to, to, to play a little bit with the photoacoustic. And um, we use, uh, first of all, we use a photoacoustic mode, classical mode, uh, to, to try to detect what's going on in the art. And um, we have here on the left the B modes, on the right the PA mode. The PA mode, it's red means that it's highly oxygenated, blue, it's lower oxygenation level. And as you can see, the parameters here we use, it's the 21 megahertz probe with low persistency and give you four images per second. Uh, so that's why you don't see a lot of movement of, of the heart. But if you, you, you can draw some region of interest in the base or in the apex, and it gives you the possibility to assess oxygen saturation uh, not in, nearly in real time. But uh, visual sonics, uh, give me this possibility to test uh, a new mode, the PA EKV. That means you can synchronize the photoacoustic image with the entire cardiac cycle. So you can see the differences. You can, you can see uh, all the movements of the heart during one cardiac cycle. You see the diastole, the systole, and it's completely synchronized with a PA mode. That gives you the possibility to detect a little bit in more precise uh, where, the, um, where the segments are akinetic or are under movement. So you can draw a more precisely a region of interest, uh, ischemic parts, non-ischemic parts, for example. And it gives you the possibility to discriminate as well uh, the oxygen saturation level during systole and during diastole, which give you some pre uh, very, very interesting information in terms of physiological um, stuff uh, during cardiac cycle. So we use a PAKV in our study uh, to detect uh, oxygen saturation uh, after myocardial infarction, four hours, day one, day seven, as expected, we see uh, differences, a decrease in oxygen saturation in the whole uh, anterior uh, wall of the left ventricle. And as could be interesting to say that uh, this uh, oxygen saturation is highly correlated to uh, anterior wall myocardial strain. Then we move the probe to the abdomen and we try to focus uh, what's going on uh, in terms of oxygen saturation in the, in the kidney. You can see on the left B mode in sham animals, MI animals, we were able to detect the kidney here and to have some data. And uh, what's interesting here is that uh, in the acute phase after myocardial infarction, uh, day one or after four hours, you see a decrease, significant decrease by six, seven percent in renal oxygenation level. Come back to normal after seven days, uh, which is as well interesting. Um, it's correlated with some uh, liver dysfunction, uh, plasmatic biomarker, creatinemia, highly correlation. And uh, we then try to find some uh, histological sign of uh, vascular dysfunction. And we focus our work uh, on capillary pericytes. We'll explain why. Because pericytes play critical roles in uh, angiogenesis, in the regulation of capillary blood flow. 
and uh, its neural cells. And we use uh, transgenic mice where the NG2 pericytes are directly labeled with DS red. That means we have this uh, transgenic mice, we create myocardial infarction, we wait one day, kill the animals, unfortunately, and took out the kidney, liver, brain, and uh, goes to confocal images and have these images. So uh, the sham is on the top, LED ligation model is on the bottom. You can see in green, it's the nuclei uh, label with DAPI, and in red, it's the pericytes. And uh, we count uh, every pericyte uh, in, uh, in every uh, segment, slice of uh, the kidney, and we found that a decrease in pericyte number after myocardial infarction. We did that in three mice, but in triplicates and uh, in three different regions of the kidney. Then we move to the liver. We wanted to, to, uh, to, to have a look at what's going on during, in, in the liver. In the liver, we were able to assess and draw a uh, region of interest uh, in B mode and PA mode to MI and found basically similar um, results. I mean, you see a decrease in the acute phase uh, of my, after myocardial infarction, you see a decrease in oxygenation level come back nearly to normal, and it's highly correlated to liver cytosolis, uh, biomarker like azat or alat. We saw a decrease as well uh, in pericyte number. And after we moved to the brain, and uh, uh, the brain we did, uh, we did it, it in 3D, so we had this possibility to measure the oxygen saturation in the whole brain. Uh, as you can see here in white, you can see the skull, the skin, and you can see these white and red um, markers here that you can see in the whole brain, the oxygen saturation using uh, this technology. So, you, uh, so we saw in the acute phase uh, a decrease in oxygenation level in the brain, in the whole brain, come back to normal. But when we assess um, in using histological, uh, minor cerebral hypoxia uh, after MI did not affect blood brain barrier, brain structure, brain microcirculation. So we still see hypoxia, but no modification here. So to conclude a little bit for this part, uh, we had this possibility using our model, LAD ligation model, uh, we were able to detect acute and moderate hypoperfusion in kidney, liver, and brain. It was easily detected by non-invasive, non-ionizing photoacoustic imaging technology. And uh, we saw as well that early organ hypoperfusion is correlated with cardiac and multi-organ dysfunction. So after assessing the left ventricle, we uh, try to, 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 to find out what's going on in the right ventricle. If we target the right ventricle, uh, it could be interesting. Uh, so, but the right ventricle is more tricky to, to, uh, to measure in terms of function. And uh, I mean, it's quite challenging to see good right ventricle because it's behind the sternum. The geometry of the right ventricle is so different from uh, the left. So it's very difficult to handle. And, um, and basically uh, when you see the literature, the right ventricle function or dysfunction is less to this MLV. So that's, I don't understand very well because they're still very important in terms of pathological. Um, you, you, you have some example like pulmonary hypertension or even better in our case, uh, we still have in patients some right ventricle myocardial infarction. It occurs in human and the most culprit vessel is the right coronary artery. 
Uh, but in the literature, you can't find a lot of paper about animal models uh, to, 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 to see what's going on after myocardial infarction, specifically in the right side. So um, a couple of years ago, we published a methods paper about how to uh, ligate right coronary artery in mice. And uh, we, we have all the, we came through all the, all through the, the, the surgical, surgical methods to do that. Uh, quite challenging, but we succeed to do that. Um, after one day, after right coronary artery, we saw uh, an increase in infarct size just in the right side of the heart and nothing the left. And when we wait one month after that, we were able to see a huge uh, remodeling process in the right uh, ventricle and no thing in the left ventricle. So a lot of fibrosis in the right ventricle. We assess cardiac function and uh, we modify a little bit um, the, the ang angle of the probe to assess, to, to, have, uh, to have access to the long axis view of the right ventricle. You can see it in the sham on the left and uh, the RCA ligation on the right you have this possibility to detect the uh, right atrium, the tricuspid valve, and all the uh, right ventricle. Yeah. You see it's moving quite well with the sham and a huge, uh, huge right atrium, uh, dilated right ventricle, and less movement after right coronary artery. We put some numbers uh, on that. We uh, put we um, measure right ventricular function using TAPSI measurements or using strain analysis of the right ventricle. We saw a decrease in the right ventricular dysfunction. We assess as well the left ventricle function. Uh, it appears that we had, uh, after C ligation, normal systolic function. It was after one month, yeah. But we saw uh, some parameters describing that maybe after C ligation, you may expect it to see diastolic dysfunction. Why you see diastolic dysfunction? Here I show you a different angle uh, or of the, um, of the heart. It's uh, the short axis view. You see the left ventricle here, the right ventricle. It's a RCA ligation mice because the right ventricle is so huge, it's not moving anymore. But if you look at directly to the septum, you can see the septum is moving quite weirdly. And if I stop here, yeah, right here, you have this kind of D-shaped septum, especially during diastole, that uh, gives you some problem for the feeling of the left ventricle uh, during diastole. That's why probably you have uh, diastolic dysfunction here in this case. But the challenge here was to uh, image the right ventricle, especially for photoacoustic. Uh, not very easy. We uh, we needed to change the angle of the probe, the angle of the laser, but we were able to detect uh, in a short axis view uh, the um, oxygen saturation in the right side of the heart. As you can see on the top, the sham, and the bottom, the right coronary artery ligation model, B mode, photoacoustic mode. The arrow represents, yellow arrow represents the right ventricle. And you can see here that we were able to detect oxygen saturation specifically in the right ventricle. You see a decrease as well uh, in terms of oxygen saturation after right coronary artery ligation. We did some couple of measurements. Uh, it's unpublished data, so preliminary data. We were able to see a decrease in right ventricular oxygenation level after uh, one day, 
after one day. No differences when you move to the left ventricle. And what is interesting is that the brain yeah, has the same as the LAD ligation model, you see a decrease in oxygenation level in the brain. A uh, lot of works need to, to, uh, to do, need to be done uh, to, to better understand what, what's going on. And now to conclude for all this study. Uh, so after MI, especially in uh, animal model, you see a decrease in uh, cardiac output and the cardiac dysfunction uh, that leads to end organ hypoperfusion. How does it work? Uh, probably it's because you have local and systemic oxidative stress, inflammation level that can kill pericytes. And when the pericytes die, they die in a rigor mortis hypercontractility state that promotes vasoconstriction for at least uh, one day or two, and promote again uh, end organ hypoperfusion. So it's kind of vicious, vicious circles. circles. Then um, it's probably why uh, this uh, hypoxia is acute, but for at least one or two days. And that's probably why you observe long term dysfunction, for example, decreased renal function or liver cytotoxicity in the long term. So, so we need to be sure what, what's going on in long-term dysfunction in kidney and liver. And then to finish for the brain, we saw in our model that acute and moderate hypoxia uh, uh, after, so, sorry, after MI, uh, we observed acute and moderate hypoxia in the brain. And we think that it's associated with acute and chronic neuroinflammation. Um, some people publish a couple of papers about that. They observed after myocardial infarction in both mice and in patients, some neuroinflammation. But the link is not known is minor cerebral hypoxia can trigger neuroinflammation. We don't know, we don't know the mechanisms. If it's through uh, if one alpha oxidative stress, we don't know, but a uh, lot of works need to be done because after myocardial infarction, you have some long-term consequences in the brain. And uh, as, as this paper published uh, two years ago, uh, quite an interesting, um, uh, study about uh, myocardial infarction survivors have higher risk to develop vascular dementia. So in the mean, if you understand a little bit better the mechanisms involved in terms of minor hypoxia or neuroinflammation, if you can target that you may um, repress uh, the, the apparition of dementia and depression. So I'm finished for, for today. I would like to thank all our collaborators, uh, our team in Montpellier, and uh, our collaborators in the University Hospital in Montpellier, some collaborator, collaborators for the neurovascular imaging in Bordeaux and in Montpellier, and special thanks to all the team of Visual Sonics, specific, specifically Jitin Jos, uh, Philippe Trocher, Philippe Davo, give me this possibility to test uh, the photoacoustic uh, EK, uh, mod, EKV modes. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, uh, I will try to answer it. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, Pierre, for that excellent presentation. I think you covered some really interesting topics that I believe our uh, audience here uh, found quite useful. So at this point, I, I'd like to encourage everyone, if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom panel. And uh, we already have some trickling in here. So I'm going to get started right away. Uh, after MI surgery, some animals suffer from chest adhesions that would limit the movement of the ventricular wall. How do you deduct the impact when analyzing the motion of the ventricular wall in your echo images? <clears throat> Yeah, it's uh, always a problem when, when you're doing some uh, in vivo surgery. 
you have a lot of uh, scar tissue, some inflammation around, and uh, you have some limited access, uh, basically, to, uh, the, the, to, 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 to have good images. Uh, so we, use, we, we try to um, use by hand, I, I mean, we take the, the probe by hand and try to move uh, all around the, the thoracic cage and to find the best, um, the, the best uh, images and try to avoid the um, scar tissue, uh, to try to avoid scar tissue and try to make very small incision. That will reduce uh, probably the chest adhesion. So. Great, thank you so much. So the next question, uh, what is the spatial resolution of the EKV imaging technique? In other words, what's the minimum size of the ROI or region of interest that you may choose or you may draw? So we use a 21 megahertz uh, probe that give you, um, if I don't say, uh, that give you a special resolution nearly uh, 70, 80 micron. So basically you can select a very small area, even if you use a, a 21 megahertz probe. So um, you can select nearly, uh, very, very, very small uh, areas. I can't uh, remember which uh, precisely what to give you some numbers, but uh, go down to millimeters. Great, thank you. Uh, could you comment on the difference between the Vivo 3100 and the Vivo LaserX systems? Uh, is it possible to upgrade a 3100 to a LaserX system? Um, and the second to that, uh, the use of the, can you comment on the use of the Vivo Laser X system in mice versus rat, particularly when you're looking at right ventricular function? Yeah, so the Vivo, so the Vivo 3100 is just the, give you the ultrasounds and you can buy uh, after that the laser cards um, to do the laser to do the laser uh, X. So the combination between the Vivo 3100 and the laser cat, it's called, I think, the laser X from, uh, from Visual Cynics. And uh, I think, uh, but you are probably, uh, the, the people of Visual Cynics are better, can give you better answer, but you can upgrade uh, easily the, if you have the Vivo 3100, you can buy the Vivo, the, the, the laser cart and have a, an upgrade to do that, to do the photoacoustic images. And, I'll just uh, uh, add in there, Pierre, that you are correct. Uh, you yeah. can add, it's called the Laser X solution. So you can add a laser cart to your current 3100 system. Yeah, and it's all connected together. So um, not very difficult to use. And uh, the differences between mice and rats, uh, especially in right, in right ventricle function, uh, to be honest, I just did some mice uh, animals and not yet, I didn't use it in rats, but I'm sure uh, it's possible to do that. Um, I need to do that, uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't have time to do that. <laughs> So I can't answer very, very precisely about what's the condition for what photoacoustic imaging, especially in the right ventricle. But it should work. Great, thank you. So the next question, how does uh, bone or fat interfere with photoacoustic signals or photoacoustic imaging? Our bones, um, we had this possibility to, uh, to do that through the skull. So it doesn't, we, we try uh, at the beginning, try with the skull and without the skull. Uh, of course, we have better resolution uh, without the skull, but it's so uh, easy to do it without, uh, without any surgery or don't need to remove any skin or skull. You can increase the gain and uh, you have these nice images uh, for the, 
for the brain. So it's working quite well uh, for, for the brain. We tested that in other model uh, when, uh, for example, traumatic brain injury uh, specifically, and we observe a decrease in oxygenation level in the brain uh, in a very precise region uh, without, with, with the skull intact. Uh, for the fat, uh, of course, it will probably, I think it's working well as well. Um, didn't do that in obese uh, mice, probably uh, we'll try to do that in the next, uh, next situation. Um, I'm not so sure that it will interfere with uh, photoacoustic images. Um, still work, I think. Great, thank you. So the next uh, question is, hi, Pierre, very nice talk. I have a few questions. So the first one, and I'll just I'll ask them one by one here. Uh, can you explain again why you chose the 21 megahertz probe instead of the 40 megahertz or the higher frequency probe for the SO2 measurements? So, um, we can do uh, we can do the forty megahertz to do photoacoustic, uh, but the, the problem is the forty megahertz is that it's the depth the depth of the of the probe. You can go uh, nearly to one centimeter, and what is important in photoacoustic is that you need to have nearly half a um, 500 microns left between the skin and the laser to have a good um, good focusing of the laser laser in the skin. So it gives you more uh, possibility when you use a 21 megahertz. You can go deeper, so you can uh, so it's easily to, to 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 have some space filled with gel, and you have better uh, better images with that. Uh, that's the reason, mostly the reason for photoacoustic. Great. Uh, so the second question is, could you measure the area of ischemia in the left ventricle after myocardial infarction using the SO2 measurement? Uh, for this work, we use a wall uh, um, left ventricle. I mean, we include the um, basal, mid, and apex. But of course, uh, we did that. We didn't publish that. But of course, we can. You can uh, define the area uh, in ischemic zone and the non-ischemic zone, and uh, you can do that in 3D as well. It takes some time, but you have this possibility to to have some stacking photoacoustic images and to try to create. Um, a 3D zone of the ischemic area when you um, measure the oxygenation level. Great, thank you. And that would uh, create some really nice images and it would be an interesting experiment to go through. Um, third question here is, have you looked at later time points other than seven days in kidney notably? Uh, do you expect normalization of perfusion even if cardiac output remains low? through vasodilation? Have you checked the renal artery diameter and blood flow uh, with Doppler? No, we didn't check that uh, for the moment. We just stop at seven, seven days. Um, we'll probably do that in the right ventricle uh, infarct model um, in long term and uh, probably try to compare to left ventricle. Um, and to be honest, I saw a couple of paper uh, showing that there is some fibrosis after long, uh, a few, few weeks after myocardial infarction. Uh, I have no idea. Probably yes, there is still some uh, small hypoxia in uh, in the kidney um, after a few weeks. But it's very very interesting to, uh, to 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 check that and to be sure that. And I'm sure that photoacoustic imaging can uh, try to answer that. You, you can answer that. Great. 
So the next question here, uh, how come LV, the left ventricular cavity does not have signals of hemoglobin? Uh, I don't know. Can you repeat the question, please? So uh, it's talking about the actual chamber, the LV chamber, why doesn't it have a signal from the hemoglobin? Yeah, yeah, because probably it's too fast, you know. Um, you, you have, we put the gain, uh, we measure, we uh, put the gain and we try to, if you increase the gain, you will see some measurements, okay? You will see some, uh, some uh, oxygenation level, uh, but we try to adjust the gain to have, to, to highlight uh, what's going on in the tissue where the flow is lower than in the left ventricle where the flow is really higher. You, you, it's probably too fast to, to see very nice uh, images, but if you increase again, you can see it. Great, thank you. So the next is uh, more about the brain. Do you see any uses for this technology in brain disorders or brain imaging? Yeah, brain disorders. Uh, we did that, uh, we published that two, uh, one year ago exactly one year ago when we did some traumatic brain injury uh, in juvenile mice. Uh, we did one impact uh, on the left side of the brain. Uh, we saw a decrease uh, in oxygenation level, uh, acute one, uh, come back to normal after three days, come back to normal and normalize after one month. And it was correlated with some MRI uh, measurements of edema uh, because uh, we were able to measure edema with MRI and we saw exactly the similar, uh, similar uh, we saw edema in the, in the acute phase of TBI. So uh, yeah, we are looking that on seizure as well uh, before and after seizure in mice. Okay, great. So the next question here, would you recommend handheld scanning post MI surgery to avoid scar tissue uh, after the myocardial infarct? And how did you overcome this when using photoacoustics where scanning by hand is not an option due to the light box? Yeah, yeah, um, I think it's easier to, uh, to, to, to add the, 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 the to, to held by hand, uh, to use by hand, because you can move very easily on the right and the left, and you gain some time um, to, to have a short axis, long axis, uh, MV, uh, uh, whatever you want. Even if it's myocardial infarction, it takes less than uh, 10 minutes. Uh, but for photoacoustic, uh, I know it's a little bit more tricky, and uh, but um, because you use a uh, 20 megahertz probe, uh, you have less spatial resolution, but you have, but it's uh, give you a better resolution in terms of scar. You don't see a lot of the scar tissue. So you can still go uh, through the, you, what, what, what I do basically it's, try to find the good angle, angle in, uh, by hands. And when I have the good angle, I put the photoacoustic probe at the same angle I did by hand and try to have nice images with that. Great, thanks. And, and that's a great tip. I often recommend that to our users, even just with ultrasound as well. Yeah. So the next question starts with a compliment. So excellent presentation. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on why kidney SO2 levels recovered after MI, although function is still impaired. It's intriguing since the brain and liver still show low SO2 at the final time point. Yeah, we don't know yet. We use for, for uh, the renal function, we use only the uh, creatinemia. Uh, which is a good biomarker, but probably uh, not as good as we expected. So uh, we need probably uh, do more uh, renal function, probably it's come back to normal in other biomarkers. And um, 
we don't know yet. Uh, we have no idea. But uh, I know that a couple of papers show that uh, after MI, in the long term, after MI, you have some um, fibrosis. So you still have some um, cardiac dis uh, sorry, some renal dysfunction. Um, for the liver and the brain, for the liver, I don't know. Uh, but for the brain, uh, it's a more protective organ and probably the blood brain barrier plays a role. Try to, uh, because we didn't see any precise um, uh, deaths in the brain. So probably there are some protective mechanisms. Uh, but still, you can you can see inflammation. So a um, lot of works need to be done to, to, to better understand the mechanisms here. Great. Thank you. So the next one says, very interesting work, lots of compliments here. Is photoacoustic imaging also effective in humans? Yes, uh, you can find the, in the literature a couple of... Uh, so some paper about uh, using photoacoustic in human. Mostly it's clinical research. It's not used in routine yet. Um, I'm not sure that it's approved to, with FDA or whatever, but um, mostly they use a photoacoustic in dermatology uh, to find out um, uh, what's going on in, uh, in some uh, melanoma for example, and a um, couple of papers show that uh, you can detect atherosclerosis in the carotids as well. Um, so a lot of things need to be done uh, to, to, uh, to go in clinics. Great, thank you. So we've uh, hammered you with a lot of questions. We'll do a couple more, but I do encourage anyone, if you do have a question, um, Pierre has, has offered kindly enough to follow up with anyone whose question was not able to be answered live. So I do encourage you, even if we run out of time here yeah. to uh, put in your question, uh, do so with your name as opposed to anonymously. Otherwise we can't, uh, we can't figure out who you are or get back to you. So final two questions. The first, is it possible to use the system in large animals such as pigs? Uh, the actual uh, vivo laser X, um, it's probably not possible because uh, um, probe is uh, so it goes maximum to 15 or 20 megahertz, so you don't have a lot of depth. But uh, if I don't say some mistake, uh, you have a new system, uh, the vivo F2 that give you the possibility to change the probe and to have some low frequency probe. And I think it can be combined to a photoacoustic laser cut and you can go deeper. So probably it's a better solution to go to the peaks, for example, or monkeys or whatever you want, bigger than a mice or rats. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. I'll just add to that. Uh... Obviously, it depends on what you're interested in imaging. People have certainly published uh, looking at pig ear or anything superficial like that. Uh, you can do with our traditional laser X system. But as uh, Dr. Sicard noted, we do have uh, the Vivo F2, which does uh, allow you to do photoacoustics using lower frequency ultrasound. Uh, so that's something uh, I encourage you to please follow up with us and we can uh, tell you a bit more information about that. Okay, so uh, lots of questions here, but we'll take one final Good. one before we give you a break. Uh, so what is the sampling volume for SO2? Other techniques like near-infrared spectroscopy have rather large volumes that include many individual capillaries and results in some um, are unknown, results are unknown as far as the integration over that large volume. Um. It's a tricky question. Uh, I don't know the answer, <laughs> to be honest. But the sampling volume of SO2, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, okay. I need to find out. Um, <laughs> or anyone can answer that. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, we've. Uh... 
you've done an extremely good job in answering all these questions that really have come from across the board. Um, so I, I do want to thank you again so much. Again, if uh, you have another minute or so as we wrap up, if you have a final question for Dr. Sicard, we will uh, connect you afterwards with him. Um, but at this point, I'd like to thank Dr. Sicard so much for your presentation. It was really very engaging, um, as we can tell by the number of questions that have come in from our audience here. Uh, so thank you so much for, for agreeing to present with us today. And I'd like to thank our audience so much as well for attending. Uh, so I do encourage you to contact us if you have any further questions. I know there was a question about uh, adding a laser photoacoustics to your ultrasound system. If you did um, put that question in anonymously, we cannot follow up with you. So please uh, follow up with us using our website or you can send us a chat um, before this webinar ends today. Um, if you wanna see any previous recorded webinars or sign up for any of our future webinars, please visit our website. You can also see us on any of the social media channels and at uh, many of the virtual conferences that are upcoming. And then for anyone who's currently using our system, we do have a training video portal available for your use called the Learning Hub, and you can find out more about that on our website. So with that, thank you very much everyone for attending and we hope to see you next time.